Hello, I'm Tom Ingram, and this is Tech Track. Two months ago, we covered a number of aspects of current drivability concerns. Today, we'll again get into drivability, future drivability, because today, we'll be unveiling a brand new engine, the very latest in sophisticated power plant design, all part of your annual new product update, your chance to preview 1991 excitement Pontiac style. And although engine news is the biggest story for 1991, it's not the only story. We have significant developments throughout our eight-car series for next year. So let's go through the 91 lineup in order, beginning with the car that did so much to forge Pontiac's high-performance reputation, the Pontiac Grand Prix. You don't have to raise the hood to get excited about the 1991 Grand Prix. This car is new just about everywhere you look, including its new model lineup. The LE Coupe is now designated SE, while an entirely new SE sedan is added to the line. At the same time, the former SE Coupe becomes the Grand Prix GT Coupe. The Turbo Coupe and STE Turbo Coupe options are dropped to make way for an all-new engine transmission team option. Among the car's many styling changes, we see new mini-quad headlamps for the SE and GT Coupes. Here, two built-in levels help in aligning the beams horizontally, that is, the same distance off the road. And this is the new 3.4-liter engine. An engine never before offered by Pontiac, never before offered by General Motors, a first for the corporation. Available on all 1991 Grand Prix models except the LE sedan, this 3.4-liter V6 ushers in a number of major design innovations, like twin dual cams, that's right, four camshafts in all. Like 24 valves, two intake and two exhaust per cylinder. Like 210 horsepower at 6,000 RPM and 215 foot-pounds of torque at 4,800 RPM, plus a host of state-of-the-art refinements. And to go with this great new 3.4-liter engine, an equally new electronic four-speed automatic transmission. Years in development, this revolutionary unit greatly reduces the amount of hydraulic shifting by using solenoids to help control transmission mode. Another development, a smooth shifting five-speed Gatrog manual transmission available with the new engine except on the SE sedan. Since this transmission will be serviced as a complete unit, it should pose no special problems for you. So there you have it. The new 3.4 24-valve overhead twin dual-cam engine teamed with either a new electronic automatic transmission or a new five-speed Gatrog manual unit. We'll be looking at the new engine in greater detail later, and an upcoming tech track will be devoted to the new electronic automatic transmission. You should also be aware that this transmission, the 4T60E, is the subject of a required two-day course for 1991. But now, let's turn to developments among the other 1991 Pontiacs, beginning with the 1991 Pontiac Grand Am. You're looking at the new entry-level model for this series. The Grand Am SE introduces a new state-of-the-art anti-lock braking system, the Delco ABS-6, as standard. This is a compact add-on unit that attaches to the master cylinder. Fewer parts make it lighter, simpler, and lower in cost. It's also quieter, with no pedal feedback. It consists of a hydraulic modulator assembly bolted directly to the master cylinder and an electronic control unit, or ECU, up at the dash. This unit reads wheel speed data and directs ABS component operation. Its circuitry and programmed software feature a very comprehensive diagnostic system to simplify troubleshooting. In fact, it offers 58 Tech 1 codes in all. Also helpful, of course, are the warning lights that the driver sees. So let's go through that. Ignition on. The red brake light comes on for an instant. The amber ABS light comes on for about three seconds. Driving mode. The red light will come on and stay on to signal low brake fluid or parking brake engagement. The amber light, on the other hand, is used to signal two types of problems. If it flashes, there is an ABS problem, but ABS operation is not hampered. However, the unit should be serviced. If it stays on, there is an ABS problem and ABS operation is discontinued. For 1991, 
The red brake telltale light comes on and the amber light stays on any time the ECU sees that unit motor movement is not correct as commanded. CPT video course 55205.05 provides in-depth servicing coverage for the new unit. With the 2.3 liter quad 4, a 3.77 first gear ratio increases low end acceleration, while all models feature larger front brake rotors and calipers. There is a new essential two-piece ball joint separator tool for the 1991 Grand Am. This tool, J38892, is being released to avoid damage to the sensor ring of the new ABS system. There's also a new fuel pressure gauge kit, tool J29658-100, for servicing this engine in 1991. This tool is essential for servicing new Grand Am and Grand Prix models with this engine because of higher 1991 fuel pressures and the lack of a Schrader valve. Bonneville greets the new model year with minimal styling changes, but a number of significant mechanical improvements. A development you will all want to know more about is a new brake transmission interlock, standard for all 1991 Bonnevilles. With this system, the driver must depress the brake pedal to actuate a hidden solenoid in order to shift out of park. The idea, of course, is to inhibit inadvertent lurch forward. This is a very important feature from the standpoint of customer satisfaction for two reasons. First, if customers aren't aware of how it works, they won't be able to get out of park to drive the car simply because they're not applying the brake. Second, the feature is a protection to the driver and occupants. Its proper functioning should be verified after any servicing. Here you simply try to get out of park with and without the brake pedal depressed. Possible causes of park position lockup include a faulty solenoid or circuit wiring, as well as the more familiar mechanical linkage hangups. Like the Grand Am, the Bonneville also introduces a new anti-lock braking system, but this is the Tevis Mark IV, not to be confused with the new Grand Am Delco ABS 6 system. However, they do share certain features. For example, on both units, the dual brake line system is diagonal, not fore and aft as before. Equally important, a new system isolation design for both systems means that power brake action is retained if the ABS fails. In previous designs, such failure meant the car reverted to manual braking. You should find servicing simpler for both systems, and both systems rely on Tech 1 diagnostics. In this regard, there's a new essential Tech 1 cartridge, TK03030A, required for servicing both new systems as well as the ABS-3. Now let's look at the Tevis Mark IV and see what we have here. The Bonneville version uses a remote pump and pressure modulator valve, or PMV, both located at the left front fender shell. The PMV is not serviceable internally and must be replaced as a unit. The design also features its own separate mini master cylinder up on the cowl. This independent cylinder includes a three-chamber reservoir with an integral fluid level switch. In this unit, the brain is called an electronic brake control module, or EBCM, and is serviced as a unit. It is mounted onto the sheet metal under the dash. These split locations should simplify service accessibility. The light system is similar to that of the Delco ABS-6, but you should note that trouble codes here cannot be flashed by these lights. So make sure you check the proper service manual when servicing any 1991 ABS system. As with the Delco ABS system, there is a comprehensive CPT video course for the Bonneville Tevis system. This too is a required high priority training course. While on the subject of brakes, we need to mention that the Bonneville rear brake retaining return spring is new for 1991, requiring essential tool J38400. This same tool can also be used to remove and install the adjuster spring and to activate the self-adjuster mechanism. A development certain to be welcome to all technicians is the adoption of a new maxi-fuse system in this series. The beauty here is the use of plug-in type fuses to replace fusible links. No more wire cutting, no more soldering. Up front, new front end suspension struts mean a more positive ride, a better road feel. And for the power steering, we have a more effective fluid cooler.
Also new on the Bonneville is a simplified PL300 door lock system with an easier action and easier servicing. Since both the linkage and mechanism are different, check the service manual for proper procedures. The harmonic balancer on the Bonneville 3800 engine is also new for 1991. This means you need a new puller for removal. Tool J38197. It is designed so that the balancer can be removed without damaging the ignition interrupter ring. For rear crankshaft seal installation, Essential Tool J38196 helps assure that the seal is put on square to the bore and to a specific depth. Instructions are included on the tool. The Sunbird for 1991 introduces a new entry-level coupe and sedan. While the 3.1-liter V6 becomes standard on the GT Coupe, it's also available on the LE Coupe, sedan, convertible, and the SE Coupe. It is not available on the new entry models. For models with the 2-liter engine, a quarter wave tuner reduces engine induction noise. As you know, the Pontiac Transport was all new for 1990, and it's still making a name for itself in the industry. For 1991, however, two engineering refinements of interest to service personnel are quieter brake pads and an added 12-volt auxiliary power source for cellular phones, CB radios, and the like. Now, moving to the Le Mans, we see that styling changes are light for the Le Mans, but you should note that the GSE is dropped for 1991. Two mechanical advances, however, will definitely affect servicing. First, a new cam belt tensioner for the 1.6-liter engine means longer cam belt life. Second, owners will be able to take advantage of a new dealer kit to add air conditioning to their standard heavy-duty heater. Installation procedures were thoroughly covered in the June Air Conditioning Tech Track video supplement. The Pontiac 6000 is basically unchanged for 1991, other than the dropping of SE all-wheel drive and wagon models. A point, however, on air conditioning system testing and refrigerant recovery. On 1991 6000 series, Grand Prix, Transport, and Firebird models, the high side charge valve assembly has a new configuration. Although previous adapters will fit the new assembly, they will not be able to open the valve. So you will need a new adapter, tool J38702, to service the air conditioning on these models and J38704 for removal of the valve. The 1991 Firebird, by contrast, greets the coming model year with an all-new look. You should note that the front fascia features special ducts to better cool front brakes on Firebird Trans Am and GTA models. So there they are, the 1991 Pontiacs. And now, let's go to our big engine story, the 1991 Grand Prix 3.4 liter V6. And with us to tell that story is John Hardy. John, with a totally new engine like the 3.4, there has to be a lot of ground to cover, especially from a servicing standpoint. Well, yes, there is, Tom. So much, in fact, that there's no way to cover everything, all that a technician has to know. But we don't need to. The engine sections of the 1991 Grand Prix service manual do a thorough job for us. There are also two important training courses available to help here a CPT video course on engine mechanical, and a one-day course on diagnosing the engine's fuel and emission systems. Both are high-priority training requirements for 1991. In the meantime, I can provide an overview and hit some of the salient differences between the 3.4 and our other engines. And some of the key servicing differences? Oh yes, we'll do that too. Good. Now as I understand it, we're talking about an overhead cam engine. I thought they went way back. Well, yes, they do, Tom, but the 3.4 liter V6 features twin dual overhead cams. That's four overhead cams in all, plus 24 valves, and that's different. You see, the original overhead cam idea, of course, did combine the advantages of large valve openings and direct low friction valve trains. This allowed better breathing and higher RPMs. So, for a number of years, the industry concentrated on fuel-air mixture control electronic fuel injection systems. You should note that this new engine features multi-port fuel injection and the speed density system as in the 3.1. But even with this precise electronic control of the mix itself, there was a way to get even larger valve openings and even better breathing. There was? Oh yes, by using four valves per cylinder instead of two because four smaller valve circles add up to more total area than two. 
However, the short cylinder head length in a V engine restricts the number of lobes you can put on a camshaft. So we use four camshafts in our new engine. That sounds simple enough. Simple in concept, Tom, but as you'll see, there's a lot more to this new engine than larger valves. For example, the Rochester fuel system eliminates the need for a cold start injector. Okay, but let's stay for the moment with these 24 valves. Tell us how it all goes together. Okay, we should start with the cylinder head. It houses two intake valves and two exhaust valves for each cylinder, 12 to a bank. Each valve train consists of the valve, valve guide, spring, cap, seal, and key. The valve guides and their inserts are pressed in. An important advance here is the use of centered metal insert guides that contain a special dry lubricant, a significant advance in itself. Next, we have two camshaft carriers, one for each bank. Made of lightweight aluminum, each carrier houses one intake and one exhaust camshaft. So you don't have to alternate intake and exhaust valve lobes on these camshafts. Uh, right, Tom. And you can see how the lobes are paired since we're opening and closing two valves at a time in the same cylinder. Now, the carriers provide the camshaft bearing surfaces while rear thrust plates absorb longitudinal thrust and maintain camshaft position. Of particular interest is how the system is actuated from the crankshaft. It's a two-phase operation. The key is this centrally located intermediate shaft this shaft is chain driven directly by the crankshaft. Uh, that's the first phase. The shaft in turn then uses a secondary timing belt to drive our four camshafts. Uh, that's the second phase. Wait a minute, why secondary? Well Tom, we want to distinguish it from the serpentine drive belt uh, that comes off the crankshaft pulley to power engine accessories. You need to keep the name straight. Incidentally, the front cover is a single cast aluminum unit that permits the accessories to be mounted directly on it. This reduces the number of parts required and results in a more precise alignment of the accessory pulleys and drive shaft. It's hard to mistake the secondary timing belt. This is a flexible cogged unit that engages the four camshaft sprockets. We'll get to that when we cover timing. But first, Let's continue with valve operation. Motion is transmitted from the camshaft lobe through a hydraulic lifter directly to the valve tip. This combination of four valves with a center spark plug is highly efficient. It optimizes airflow and combustion characteristics and at the same time minimizes valve train mass from maximum engine RPM potential. We should also touch on the lubrication system. The 3.4 liter V6 features a full flow oil filter and a high capacity gear type oil pump. Pressure is controlled by a regulator valve inside the pump. You should also know that the oil distribution cover includes an anti drain back valve. It acts to retain oil in the overhead as well as in the passage below the valves after the engine is turned off. This reduces cold start friction wear and engine startup noise. The cover diverts oil to the left and right bank camshaft carriers, while longitudinal passages carry oil to the hydraulic lifters. The rear camshaft thrust plates are lubricated with pressure oiling supplied at the root of a plate groove. Fine, but what about timing now? That's always a major service concern. Timing procedures are carefully spelled out in the service manual. It is important to note that no keys or pins are used to establish crankshaft to camshaft timing in this engine. But what really makes this engine unique is that the camshaft is not splined to the camshaft sprocket. This means that the relative position of the camshaft to the sprocket is infinitely variable. You can move that camshaft around to any position. Once the camshaft is in the desired position, it is locked into place through the use of a tightened down crush washer. Such an arrangement obviously affects timing procedures. It does. So every new 3.4 liter engine carries factory painted timing marks on the four camshaft sprockets, the intermediate drive shaft sprocket, and the crankshaft damper. 
Now, if you remove only the belt, you can go with the factory timing marks because you haven't changed the timing. For timing, refer to the service manual. There are also a few pointers to keep in mind any time you remove that secondary timing belt. First, if you intend to reuse the same belt, be sure to mark the direction of travel before you take it off. Second, always handle this belt, new or used, very carefully. Make sure you don't kink it in any way. In installing the belt, there is a set sequence shown in this service manual diagram that must be followed. You also want to make certain the belt teeth are engaging all sprockets before rotating the engine. Another point, power steering fluid can seriously damage this belt. So, before disconnecting power steering lines in any situation where the belt is exposed, siphon the fluid from the reservoir. The secondary timing belt has its own tensioner, located here. The tensioner assembly includes an actuator, lock pin, and bracket, plus a small tapered bushing between the actuator and mounting base. Special care should be taken to not lose or damage this part. Well, that's about it, Tom. I think we've covered all the key points, and as I indicated, the service manual is your primary reference. It covers everything, step by step. I'm sure that's true, John, but your overview has given us a valuable perspective. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, Tom. Glad to contribute. Now, before leaving our update, let me just mention two additional courses in the 1991 program. The first is a required one-day high-priority course covering 1991 new model product features. It's basically for service advisors. The other is a recommended four-day training course devoted to transmission and brake electrical system diagnosis. It's designed to provide the basic electrical skills you'll need to diagnose and service problems associated with these new systems. This four-day course is a must for any technician who's not already completed the eight-day GM Set 1 electrical course. Those who have need not take this shorter version. In the coming months, we'll be back with coverage in-depth on the teammate of the 3.4-liter V6, the new electronic four-speed automatic transmission. And we'll also be bringing you drivability, too. Here, we plan to cover stall problems on 3-liter and 3.8-liter mass airflow engines. You don't want to miss either release. One last special note regarding the 1991 Certified Product Specialist meetings that began early this month and will continue until October 12th. These important meetings will include workshops on product value, performance, advantages, and technical features. Here's the schedule. We think you'll find these meetings to be well worth your time and urge you to attend. In the meantime, I'm Tom Ingram, signing off for TechTrack, the Pontiac Performance Network.